Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for March 8th, 2021. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server, you can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time is changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's also a calendar available that we keep updated. Uh, and just a note, particularly for those outside the US, we will change to our summertime hours, also known as daylight saving time, next week. So if you're not um, aligned with those American um, clock changes, be aware that the meeting time changes by one hour next week. This meeting is recorded. We record the audio from the voice channel and the video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you're still welcome to participate via text. The video of the meeting will be posted to YouTube, and the audio is released as a podcast. If you can't find it on your favorite podcast service, let us know. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but can't make it to the meeting, that's where you can leave your hug reports and status updates, and I'll read them off during the meeting. The notes document also contains timestamps to go along with the video so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. A link to the notes document is posted to the CircuitPython channel on the Adafruit Discord every week. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc. Now, as for the meeting structure, it's held in five parts. The first part is community news, where we take a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's also a preview of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, a statistical overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've all been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. And the last part is in the weeds, an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can be a result of status updates or something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that's how the meeting will go. And with that, I'm ready to take the first time code of the meeting as we transition to community news. Um, so first up, and uh, Foamy Guy, I don't know if you were going to be able to get the links today, um, and if not, maybe Katni can, but uh, CircuitPython 6.2.0 Beta 3 was released last week. It's the fourth beta release of CircuitPython 6.2.0 and has many fixes and enhancements. The big item is across most ports, it adds a second USB serial channel, but there's also a bitmap tool module and as well as the removal of the limitation of displayio.group size. So um, check out the release notes for a lot more and download it from circuitpython.org. Second big item, the Adafruit Feather RP2040 is available and in the Adafruit shop. And more are being fabbed all the time, so sign up to be notified when they are available. Uh, CircuitPython has been featured on the Tom's Hardware Piecast with, of course, our own uh, Scott Shawcroft. So there's a link to uh, YouTube and Twitter. And uh, I guess best place to pick up these links is in the notes document. Finally, some news from around the web. I've got links from GitHub and Twitter and Hackaday and YouTube. Um, we've got getting started with CircuitPython on the Raspberry Pi Pico with NeoPixel LEDs. A suite of tools, including CircuitPython for building and uploading firmware, deploying files to devices and testing modules an adapter for a Raspberry Pi Pico to a Featherwing, a macro keypad that uses Raspberry Pi Pico and CircuitPython, and, second appearance from Scott, 
Uh, he was on the Simple Electronics podcast uh, last issue on YouTube. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete, art of, the complete archives are on adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the changes. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email to cpnews at adafruit.com. And there will be a lot more in the newsletter. I looked at the draft before this meeting and good stuff like always. With that, we will transition again to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is a statistical overview uh, of how things are going, and uh, it's divided into several subparts. And I will start with overall and then hand it off to some of the other folks to tell you about the portions that they um, kind of take charge of. So overall, we had a huge number of pull requests merged, 52 pull requests from 23 authors. And pull requests are the way that the software moves forward and changes. And uh, having 23 authors means there were nearly two dozen people who improved CircuitPython in the last week. And that's just amazing. As well as, I, I forget if I said the 11 reviewers. And so we also like to recognize uh, authors who are new or infrequent contributors. And I'll call out some of those names. Thomas 6G, Orbit Rasu, MKLHX, um, Tio Mitch, Adam Candy, Tyler Crumpton, Rotman, uh, and Admiral Maggie are uh, names that are less familiar or I think new. Uh, our, our 11 reviewers, thanks so much to them. Getting a review of the changes is always key because it makes sure that there are at least two pairs of eyes uh, on every problem and its resolution. If you uh, see your future potentially as a reviewer, we invite you to start by commenting on pull requests with, I tested this, I looked over the code, it makes sense, I see a problem here, um, I see room for improvement, and uh, we would love to help you move up to being an official reviewer, which comes with rights and responsibilities like the ability to merge pull requests when appropriate. On the issues front, uh, we had 20 closed issues by 12 people and 23 opened by 19 people. So the first thing to note is again, the, the range of engagement that we have um, from all these different people. We would prefer to see the number of issues not trend up over time, so we missed that this week uh, by increasing three issues. And with that, I will pass things over to Scott to tell us about the core of CircuitPython. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so in the core, we had eight pull requests merged from four different authors, KMatch98 and T.O. Mitch uh, and Jerry Needell are all relatively new authors or, or infrequent authors. So thank you to those folks. We had three reviewers. So thank you to our reviewers. And we have 21 open poll requests, which is about, uh, about normal for us. So um, if you are involved in any of those longer term poll requests that are open, please take a look and make sure that they're moving forward. Um, otherwise, uh, Thank you all to the folks that are making pull requests. Uh, issues wise, we had four closed issues by two people and five open by five people. So we're net up one for the core uh, for a total of 419 open issues. Uh, this does tend to trend upwards uh, slowly, uh, but that's, that's potentially okay. We triage all issues using the milestone system. Um, and we have seven issues that are not assigned to milestone, which means they haven't been triaged yet, but it's also like Monday morning uh, here in Seattle, at least. So we're going to work on that. Um, we have three different milestones for 6.x um, with a, over 50 issues under those. So we're going to have to take a look at those. I think that's in Dan's plan anyway. And then we have seven issues for 7.0. Um, so that's where we are with PRs and issues. And generally, things are moving. So thank you to everybody. Um, expect to see us kind of try to buckle down on 6.2 and uh, get a 6.2 stable out the door um, 
and then after 62 i think we're planning on going to 7.0 so you'll it'll be a longer a longer cycle after 62 uh, and we'll get some exciting stuff in thank you scott mm -hmm. um so next up is katney to tell us about the libraries thanks jeff so across the libraries, uh, this applies to all Adafruit CircuitPython libraries and a few extra things, including the CircuitPython community bundle. Uh, we had 41 pull requests merged from 18 different authors, including most of the new names you read out, and 10 reviewers. Uh, we had two pull requests merged that were, or three that were over a week old, um, which is good, and most of them were three days or less. Uh, leaving us with uh, 91 open pull requests, which is high, but there's a reason for that, which I will discuss later. Um, we had 14 closed issues by 10 people and 18 open by 14 people, leaving us with 298 open issues. Uh, we have five good first issues, and that number has gone down, which is excellent because uh, folks have um, picked up some of the first issues and completed them. So that's how those have gone away. Um, the way that you do that is uh, you can go to circuitpython.org slash contributing. And there's a, all of this information, um, a list of open pull requests, a list of open issues, and a list of library infrastructure issues. And in the list of open issues, you can search by label. Um, good first issue is one of them. So if you're new to everything, that's one place to start. If you want something a little more complicated, bug or enhancement, are both good labels to search for. Um, but you can just scroll through that and see whether anything uh, you know, sparks your interest and uh, make a comment on that issue that you'll be working on it. And we are always available to help. There is a guide on contributing to CircuitPython with Git and GitHub. And uh, we're always available on Discord to answer questions. We want you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you and we're happy to help you learn how to do that. Um, let's see. Uh, so yeah, check that out. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, um, that's where you want to start. And we had, it looks like, three new libraries uh, this week. One um, Adafruit CircuitPython library is Display I.O. Layout, and it looks like two community libraries. Uh, a display I.O. driver for the GC9A01 TFT LCD and a driver for the Gameduino 3X series of display adapters. And uh, the reason that we have so many open pull requests right now is the same reason why the updated libraries list was very long. Um, we went through and finally patched the libraries to deal with the, um, deal with the uh, PyLint update that made a check that existed the whole time actually work. Um, and it turns out that it doesn't really mesh with how we do example code. So we needed to figure out a way to make it so that it still runs on the library code where we want it to and not in the example code where we don't. We figured that out. We patched it. The way the Adabot patches work, they don't apply to everything. If there's a difference in a file, a difference in a target file, um, the patch won't apply to that library. And so that requires then um, that we go through and do manual PRs on some libraries. And that is why our PR num count is so high. Um, I closed probably 30 of them this morning, um, but that wouldn't be in this data. So anyway, um, we're making a lot of progress on that. And thank you, uh, Early Hug Report, to Dylan and Foamy Guy for all of their work on that. Um, and that's where we are with the libraries. Thanks, Katni. And for the last subsection of uh, this section, I will let Melissa tell us about the status of Blinka. Hello. Blinka is our circuit Python compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. And this week we had three pull requests merged by three authors and two reviewers. Uh, for the authors, I see TWA127, who's been a regular contributor, and Thomas6G, which I don't recall um, seeing any. Uh, they, they look new to me. Uh, and there's also Dan Halbert, who, who contributes occasionally. 
Uh, there are were seven open pull requests at this point, and there were two closed issues by one person and zero open by zero people, leaving a net of 55 open issues. Uh, there were 3,350 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we are currently supporting 70 boards. And that's it. Thanks, Melissa. And with that, we will move on to Hug Reports, the first round robin section. Um, it's a time for a little positivity and a little thankfulness for what the people around us are doing. And I will start and go through the document in the order that it is here. Um, and just a reminder that if you don't put yourself in the notes document, we will assume you're just listening in and we're happy to have you. Uh, so first, I wanted to give a hug report uh, to Scott for being a sounding board and problem solver for my PIO work. Uh, that's something that's been going on for, for the past few weeks, and um, I really caught my stride with it, and it, it took some help getting there. I've got like three thanks for Dan this week, uh, helping me with uh, getting the bootloader installed on my ADA logger, Feather M0 ADA logger, for finding a really, really good clue about these problems we've been having with I2C squared on the ESP32-S2, and then for hug reports for Dan, uh, Scott, and Lady Ada, and others who I think I've probably missed uh, for reviews and tests on the PRs I've been putting in. And uh, last but not least, to uh, Tio Mitch on GitHub, a new contributor with some small cleanup PRs. It's fun to see a new face coming in and, in this case, paying attention to some stuff that maybe we didn't pay attention to. And just bringing, bringing small improvements is great. Uh, so with that, I will pass it to Jerry, and then after that, we will go on to Jose David. Uh, hello. Um, let's see. Yeah, thanks to Dan and KMAX98 for the quick pick to the little display I issue that popped up last week. I think it was last week. And uh, and I asked NIS for some great tips on getting uh, eForth running on the STM boards, uh, something he's been very fond of doing and, and uh, kind of fun to play around with a little bit. And uh, uh, Jeff, you for uh, again, <laughs> once again, explaining to me how to use pre commit. It's nice to actually do it this time. And all the community moderators for all the moderating. Um, you all make this a better place. And especially thanks to Andon for handling a tricky issue this week. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks. All right, next I will hand things to Jose David. And if you would let me know how to pronounce your name, I'll try to do better in the future. Yeah, it's, it's Jose David. Okay. Thank you. So her report to Scott uh, to share uh, a circuit Python in uh, both Tones Hardware and Simple Electronics is, uh, was a really great discussion. To her report to Fomi Guy for uh, the refactor in the display text li library. Uh, he took the job and run away with it when I couldn't find a, an exit. And also her report to Dan to fix the transpose XY in the tile grid library. Thank you. It's uh, nice to have you here with us today. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, so next up is Katni and then Kmatch98. All right, so <clears throat> first up, I have a hug report for Dylan for writing up and running the patch on the libraries to move PyLint to the pre-commit and updating PyLint RC. Um, to Foamy Guy for helping with updating the list of libraries that were skipped by the patch for various reasons. A group hug to all of our contributors during the interim PyLint update. Thank you for your patience with us taking the time to find the right solution instead of a quick solution. A hug report to Andon on Discord for handling a particularly involved moderation situation last week. To all the community moderators for all their help keeping this community amazing. To Crayola for working on a dark mode for my website theme. To the Adafruit Learn Dev team, that's the folks that work on the Learn system uh, where all of our guides are kept for being super responsive to bug reports and feature requests. Uh, to Maker Melissa and Dan for nice chats in the last week to Anne for continuing to train me up on the newsletter, and to SAK917 on uh, GitHub for picking up a good first issue and offering to pick up more. That's awesome. 
All right. Uh, Kmatch98 is next, and then Melissa. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So first off, thanks to Deshipu for updating the Display.io group to make it um, more flexible. Uh, Katni and Dan H, thank you, uh, too, for the help on the library documentation and how to make that work. Uh, next to Foamy Guy and Scott for, for uh, PR reviews and constructive comments. Uh, next to Jose and Foamy Guy for the display text consolidation, uh, things that should uh, set the stage for the future. And last, uh, thanks to Todd Bot for the Discord demo of a cool dial gauge, and uh, in particular, some discussion on how to uh, improve the performance of display. Thanks. All right. Uh, I will hand it to Melissa, and then we will go to Scott. Hello. Uh, uh, the, uh, I will do a big report to Big Cloud for um, factory work in the 37 library. That's the Melissa, your audio was working really well earlier, but now it's not working so well. Do you Let mind me try I... something. Please Let do. Let me try something. Okay, does that sound any better? Yeah, get, get back into it and we'll see. Okay, um, I wanted to start by giving a hug report to David Cloud for your work refactoring the IS31FL3731 library, uh, to Foamy Guy for testing the portal based changes to Tom Array for uh, submitting the RockPy 4 c board, to Katni for a nice chat, and a group hug to everyone else. All right. Whatever you changed, it sure worked. Heh. All right. Um, so on deck, uh, I have notes from C. Grover, uh, but now I'll hand it over to Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug report to you, Jeff, for the VM size optimization. Uh, hug report to Gambler for both Count IO and Parallel Bus. Uh, for the RP2040. Hug report to Dave Putz for Pulse In. And a hug report for NITS for the board def for the R the NRF52840 micromod. I'm I just had got some and I'm going to use them this week, so it's perfect timing. That's it for me. Great. Uh, so after notes from Seagrover, I uh, Dan is next after that. So Seagrover thanks Zodius Infuser for insightful observations about DRV8830 style motor controllers. Took my brush DC motor game up a notch or two and will require a comprehensive rewrite of my recent learning guide. And a hug to John Park for his inspirational and uber jazzy work on two recent projects, the Pico Keyboard and Retro Reflection Workshop. Amazing. Uh, so I'll hand things to Dan and then after that to David. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks to Jantusak who's been doing a ton of work on a, a sleep pull request for the NRF. Uh, it's basically uh, done now and I have to review and test it, but uh, they did a lot of work on it, drew diagrams, it's wrote, in, in, uh, wrote up things in between. It's really a wonderful job. So thank you. Uh, thanks to, to Jeff for your excellent shrinks in the firmware size that you discovered that saves us we can fill it up with something else again. <laughs> um, thanks to Microdev, who's working on uh, the long-term process of um, merging from MicroPython upstream, and they've started. They did a bunch of they did an initial some initial work, and are now doing some more systematic work to make it easier to do. Uh, thanks to KMetch98 to review the tile grid transpose issue that came up at the last minute for the release last week. Um, thanks to Deshipu for removing the really um, thing that I always ran into, which was how many things can you put in a group. Thanks for taking that away. And thanks to Scott for working on uh, the RP2040 Flash, for making it variable size, and for doing it very quickly and doing a, a sort of a simple cleanup of that very quickly. All right. All right. It looks like I'll be reading David's notes, and then after that is Foamy Guy. So David writes a hug for Tenut for the special guest appearance on the Pi cast. And apparently David could guess an answer Scott would give. I, I don't know the context of that, so we'll all have to listen to Pi cast together after this. Uh, a hug to Arturo182 for sharing an exchange on his RP2040 Zero board trying to have a GPIO mapping compatible with the I2S hat slash bonnet, uh, a hug report to me for the PIO learn guide, 
Uh, a hug to Michael Horn for porting the Pimeroni 11 by 7 LED matrix breakout to CircuitPython, which is a work in progress, see in the weeds. And a hug to Dan H for a chat about the issue and with Maker Melissa for merging all of the PRs for IS31FL3171. Uh, so next is Foamy Guy, and then uh, looks like I will read Hugo's notes to wrap it up. Alrighty, thanks, Jeff. Um, this week, hug first one to uh, Deshipu. Um, a couple of people have mentioned Deshipu removed a restriction on display or group, um, so now you can have as keep just keep adding things to it without having to worry about max size, um, and that's really cool. So big thanks there um, to Dan H and K Match for fixing an issue that came out of that. Um, real quickly, I think over the weekend, um, to Jose, Jose David, uh, for the uh, enhancements in display text. I threw out a, an idea um, to make it so that anchored positioning could be used with the baseline, um, similar to the way that it uh, now works with XY in the recent update. Um, and Jose got that taken care of real fast also. Um, to Scott for being on the, the Tom's podcast. It was a great listen. Um, and uh, also particularly for giving me a mention um, in there. I was honored um, to, to hear that. Um, to Dan H and Microdev uh, this morning for some help with Git, um, helping me figure out a way to use pre-commit and have it avoid checking on files that are not actually relevant uh, to what I'm doing. And then lastly to Kmatch uh, for working on a fix inside the bitmap label uh, when I found a, an issue that popped up from a strange font file that has some weird stuff inside of it. Um, and that's all I got this week. Thanks. All right. I will have to scroll back and look for that um, pre-commit advice because I, I saw the conversation start and didn't see the conclusion. All right. Uh, so I have notes from Hugo, uh, who sends a hug report to Foamy Guy for Saturday's stream, to Kmatch98 and Foamy Guy again, hug reports for educating me and setting me straight, I think, on what blitting is, uh, to Jepler, Dan H., Katni, Tanut, and others who were involved in the translations and build discussion, very interesting and enlightening, and for special consideration on International Women's Day, but always thankful and grateful, my mom, the strong kick-butt woman who took uh, from, from nobody and put them in their place where necessary, and all the other women who made me who I am today, all the credit lies with them, all the blame rests on me, and all the other women and those who identify as women for being the strong, courageous, wonderful individuals that you are, for making the world a better place in your own special and talented ways. Thank you. And that's a really heartwarming way to wrap up Hug Reports. That's a good ad. That's a cool ad. Charles, could you please mute? All right, um, with that, we will move on to status updates, which is also conducted in a round robin, but it's a time to let us know what you've been up to since the last meeting and what you hope to uh, accomplish before we get a chance to meet again. And I will start and we will go in the same uh, document order. So uh, last week in the Learn system, I published a guide on doing PIO with CircuitPython I think we ended up with three or four different examples, and it was always uh, it was also, as I mentioned, a great way for me to learn about PIO because, like everybody else did, um, it, it was a, a new thing to learn about. So that was a lot of fun, and I've just continued to get more comfortable with the PIO and the RP twenty forty generally, and that feeds into kind of the big pull request that I made last week which enables the rotary I.O. module on RP2040 boards. Uh, that is, I believe, getting close to being merged. It's been tested out, but um, Scott's going to take a look and see whether there are any uh, style or substance items to work on. And with that will come some improvements to the Python API. Namely, you will be able to call the in-waiting method for a PIO program that produces output irregularly, which is kind of how a quadrature encoder uh, works. And I also spent some time looking for firmware size savings, and to my astonishment, I found a way to get back 1500 bytes, which isn't a lot. Uh, it's enough for about one and a half chess games, uh, but it's more than we're used to finding, so that will give us a little room for comfort as we uh, work on particularly keeping the M0 builds uh, 
from overflowing. And there's probably other randomness that I forgot, but this list already sounds pretty long. So uh, thanks, David, for um, explaining the joke in case you haven't seen it. There's a, a 1K implementation of chess that's not bad, um, at least for a beginner chess player like me. Anyway, so uh, this week I wrote that there is a was a PCF font problem that I wanted to look into, but I actually diagnosed and solved that before the meeting, and there's a pull request in for that. Um, I've been working on a personal project, which is a big LED matrix clock that receives the so-called atomic clock signal from uh, Colorado called WWVB. That's getting really close to being a finished thing. Um, as far as my CircuitPython work goes, um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, creating some more video content that uh, will eventually come out somewhere under the Adafruit umbrella and uh, working on some more guide stuff. Um, and there's the third item. Oh, I'm going to investigate whether the performance of the Pico is good enough to let us enable uh, MP3s and or audio mixer. Um, that's kind of an exploratory thing that I'll spend uh, maybe a day on and, and then we'll decide if it's uh, going to work out or not. And anyway, the fun stuff I alluded to, last Saturday our clothes washer died. It was 19, so it had a good life. And the replacement will be delivered tomorrow, so... All is well, but uh, not what we expected to be spending our, our time or money on, right? Uh, anyway, um, next up is Jerry and then Jose David. There's that button. All right, thanks. Uh, I, I got to change my name. It's no fun. I always feel like, take a slack, like such a slacker going after you, Jeff. Oh, don't sweat <laughs> it. Um, so, yeah, I have no idea where the week might but uh, see, some, some things I did do, I did receive some uh, black pills, um, started playing with those. And uh, was really, I'd forgotten how small the file systems are on non-express type boards, especially that one. <laughs> so I uh, did put on the two megabyte flash. When I did that, I found out that the default setup was for a much larger flash. So um, it was a good excuse to remember how to do a, a core PR, a really trivial one, but it was still fun to do nonetheless. And a good way to get back into practice doing that. Maybe I should try and do some more. Um, this week, I want to play with all those new guides that are out there for PIO and display IO and all sorts of cool stuff. So I'll try some of those. And fun stuff is I finally got around to making an alarm. It's not really Circuit Python, but it's close. Um, my, my dog, when she wants to go out, she goes and stands by the door. She doesn't do anything, she just stands there. Well, she will do something if I don't get out the door pretty soon. So I made a took a VL53 LOX L0X um, time of flight thing and a tiny Pico board from Unexpected Maker, um, which detects when the dog gets close to the door, and that sends an NQTT message over to my our Raspberry Pi Home Assistant, which then sends me a notification on my phone, and to my amazement, it works really well. Um, so really had fun with that, and uh, the dog gets gets out when she wants. Um, other fun things is I got my second dose of COVID. Really, thank you to the science and, and all the people for letting us old folks go first. It really is nice to see things moving along here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, all right. I'll pass it to Jose David and then to Katni. So last week I work on the proposal for the new directional label. Uh, this label will support uh, different language. Uh, so you can uh, write your text from right to left and left to right and uh, top to bottom. Uh, also, you can put your text upwards and downwards. So that's, that's an improvement. It works now with the, before the refactory of the display text, I need to port it to the new the proposal. Uh, this week I will work on some tests on, on, on that improvement and uh, retaking the old PRs that they were kind of um, put uh, for the for the old display text and uh, doing it again for the for the new refactor library. Uh, for fun stuff, uh, the temperature here are going up uh, above uh, zero degrees Celsius. A lot of running this week. I'm on vacation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we have Katni and then Kmatch98. Thanks, Jeff. 
So last week, uh, we finally patched all the libraries to move PyLint to the pre-commit and deal with the duplicate code checking on examples. Um, the first patch we ran didn't really apply itself to all the libraries. There's a flag you can build the patch with, and typically, if you run it with this flag, it's supposed to apply to more libraries, but for whatever reason, um, this time, it decided that it would apply itself to more libraries without the flag. So it took us a few tries. Um, we also uh, applied a patch that broke everything for as long as it took us to write another patch to revert it. Um, so we had some fun with that. Uh, and then um, when the patches are run, they spit out a list of all of the libraries to which they were not applied. And um, so we took that list and uh, a second hug report to Foamy Guy for uh, basically taking that whole list and verifying that whatever the patch missed was updated. Um, so that was super helpful. And I got through, I think, all of those PRs, except for one, uh, for a reason um, this morning. So thank you for that. Um, last week, I continued work on the BLM badge guide and then uh, wrote and published the Feather RP2040 guide. So this week, um, finished up the PRs related to the patch, which I did this morning. Um, I need to finish the RP2040 guide the, for the Feather. There's one page that was copied in that's a Feather generic um, page about uh, battery and USB, and so I need to update that to be RP2040 specific. And um, the pinouts page, uh, because the RP2040 has a lot of capabilities on a lot of different pins, um, but there's some situations where you can't use like two different sets of pins because they would collide. Um, the uh, Dan went through it after I wrote it, said it was all clear, but suggested providing a sort of backwards look up so instead of just listing the pins and what their capabilities are list the capabilities and what the available pins are as well um i didn't have time to do that last week so we published the guide but i want to add that sort of reverse lookup type thing um list to the pinouts page as well then next up is update the guide for the amg 8833 which is a thermal camera we revised the board to be a stem qt board and so there's a, a series of things that need to be updated in the guide uh, to reflect the STEMI QT revision. And then um, I'll continue on slash finish the, uh, the BLM badge guide and then um, gather uh, new product info for the cyber deck. It's, it's a Raspberry Pi bonnet and hat um, that doesn't have any specific code to it, but we'll need a general guide that just says, here it is, here's what it looks like. Um, and here's some download resources. So that is uh, the last thing um, that I will be working on. That sounds like plenty. All right, uh, so I'll pass it to KMatch and then Melissa. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So last week submitted the uh, switch widget to the graphical user interface library uh, that's uh, fairly new. Uh, and in the process learned, uh, or at least scratched the surface about Sphinx, the documentation and formatting system, particularly about how to use class inheritance of super and subclasses and a way to visualize it. Uh, also did a little bit of work on display IO bitmap routines to break them apart so they can be used in other functions, uh, which will be part of the work for this week. Uh, so this week uh, I have a couple of other widgets I want to submit for review. Uh, and most importantly, I need to write down the, at least the few tidbits I learned about Sphinx so I can do them again next time, I hope. Um, also want to add a couple of bitmap tools. These are uh, odds and ends of bitmap manipulation uh, uh, tools just to help folks that want to do some straightforward or simple things to fill a region or draw a line. Uh, and in, in particularly, I want to learn more about the vector IO library. Uh, it seems like it has quite a few interesting capabilities that may fit the bill in different situations. So I want to be able to understand that. So if people have questions, I can help uh, suggest what the best approach or uh, alternate approaches might be. 
And along the lines of fun stuff, we had uh, uh, sort of extended cold weather here in Austin a few weeks ago. So uh, as part of that, had some some uh, repairs to make on my daughter's well system, but it should be good to go for the next 25 years after this. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Um, looks like maker Melissa has had to leave for the moment, so I will read her notes and then pass things to Scott. So Melissa writes, last week, worked on Raspberry Pi BrainCraft display driver and audio driver conflicts on the latest kernel, and looked into an issue with the voice bonnet on the desktop with Google Assistant. Started looking into updating the RP LiDAR to work on a new firmware that is only available on new units being shipped, fixed some memory usage issues in portal base, added rotation to matrix portal, and fixed issues with PyLint code duplication errors, manually merged several IS31FL3731 PRs, including one which had been sitting for a while and became outdated so that everything was up to date, and updated the guides for that IS31FL3731 library. Uh, this week, working on updating the RP LiDAR library, likely either update or create a new library for the update 2.13 inch e-ink displays. I think that's the, uh, the slightly different resolution version. Working on a new guide to incorporate all of the 2.13 inch e-ink displays. Look into further audio video conflicts with other I2S boards. Update Blinka to work a bit better on 64-bit Raspberry Pi OS. And other the heading of other fun stuff, uh, Melissa has a new video up on her YouTube channel. Link is in the notes document if somebody wanted to put that in the chat as well. And I will pass that to Scott, and then after that, it will be somebody at the top of the alphabet. There's that video. Hello. So I'm getting caught up. It took Friday off. Um, my weekend was skiing on Friday, snowshoeing on Saturday, and running in the rain on Sunday. So we did lots of outdoorsy stuff, which was great. Uh, but it does mean I'm a bit behind on everything. So today's email and pull requests day uh, everybody did a lot of really cool stuff i saw i saw all the like issue and pull request stuff go by in the in the discord but i haven't looked at my email yet so excited to see all the th cool things that happened there um last week i created cascade toml for cascading toml config it's at github.com slash adafruit slash cascade toml basically allows you to like factor out uh config settings uh, and then kind of cascade them down to the final version when you need it um for example uh I created a Toml quote unquote database of flash config that's at uh, github.com slash adafruit slash nvm.toml. Basically what this allows you to do is say like for a particular wind bond or giga device flash, you can say cascade Toml and it will give you like the full settings for that particular flash, even when like some settings may be the same for a particular manufacturer. So that's kind of the, the purpose of cascade Toml. So, the next step is to tie that config into CircuitPython build uh, to generate the RP2040 stage two code for a given flash or flashes. So this will allow us to say like on this board, this flash is used and uh, get it all configured uh, the best we can for a particular, a particular flash. Um, a prerequisite that I wanted to do is that the existing Pico SDK has this like stage two flash initialization code written in assembly, and I converted it to C because I'd rather work in C land than assembly land. Uh, so I got the basic stage two work running uh, last week in C. And so this week, I'll, I'll further uh, add some features to that C code along with uh, the ability to actually like change its contents based on the flash settings from the Toml files. Um, and that, that will be a longer term way for us to handle flashes uh, in all of the ports. But for now, just the RP2040 is the one that's changing. Um, so that's that's my main work right now. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I have notes from C. Grover, and then uh, it's time for Dan. Uh, so C. Grover writes, continuing on the brushed DC motor quest, working on an update to the CircuitPython motor library to allow selecting the decay mode of most modern motor controller chips and boards. The default coasting decay mode doesn't take full advantage of the more effective braking decay mode available in newer controller chips. Using braking mode, using braking mode establishes a directly proportional relationship between throttle and motor RPM. Very handy for controlling robot velocity and calculating distance traveled. 
when coupled with lower PWM frequencies, motor spin threshold and low speed torque are dramatically enhanced as well. We'll need some advice on what UI will work best for the motor library decay mode getter setter, or perhaps just changing the default mode to braking. Submitted an issue in advance of the PR to facilitate the discussion. Plans are to rerun tests for the menagerie of brushed DC motors in the workshop inventory to compare mode differences, submit the associated PR, and, re and rewrite the previous learning guide. Hope to receive a shipment of all available Adafruit motor controller chips and boards and N20 style motors this week to verify the tests. And unrelated ish, work on the illustrations for the book of poetry continues. My drawing skills are improving, thank goodness. Still not certain what the author saw in my primitive doodles. Uh, so next we get the news from Dan, and then I will read updates from David. Okay, scrolling, here we go. Um, so I uh, last week I fixed, um, there were issues with the RP2040 bus IO, that I2C. Uh, the I2C implementation um, in uh, on the RP2040, you can't send zero length writes, um, which means you can't probe easily and stuff. So that was a that was a problem. So I fixed that and tested it. There are still some small number of um, uh, sensors, like the TCS34725, which is a color sensor, which just don't seem to work, and it's really not clear why. They waveforms look correct, but they don't work. So uh, there could be some more debugging done, but you can always use bitbangio.i2c instead of busio.i2c, and that works for everything. Um, uh, as we mentioned, I fixed the last minute bug in groups before the beta. Uh, then I released um, uh, CircuitPython 6.2.0 beta 3. Um, I fixed the uh, tile grid transpose problem. I don't remember if that was before or after the release. Um, I did some more build shrinking, uh, not as much, just, just for particular boards um, to get things to fit at the last minute while I was trying to get all the uh, PRs in for the release. I did lots of reviews and various, done various things. Um, this morning, I was editing the release notes for beta 4, which isn't be out yet for a little while. And I've been trying to keep up with the release notes by each time there's a PR, I add it to the release notes. So I don't have to do that later. And I accidentally hit publish release and there was a beta four release for about 10 minutes, but all traces of it are gone. And we can have another beta four that uh, is there because I removed everything that it, it, it labeled or built or anything. So now I'm going to keep the release notes in an issue and I will edit the top post in the issue and uh, there's no danger of doing a release from that. And it's actually, that means everybody can see it and it's actually easy to edit because uh, even though it's GitHub and Markdown, the release notes doesn't have that little nice menu bar at the top and in the issue it does. So I'll, that'll be great. Um, I was still confused about the I2C RP2040, the short rights business and I asked the designers of the RP2040 and they answered. And um, I, so I got a satisfactory answer about that and I asked them to put it in the documentation better than it is already and they will, they're planning to do that. And finally, after several days of just trying thing after thing and, and turning off code and then turning it back on gradually to see what, what broke and what didn't break, I think I have figured out how to make uh, ESP32 on the ESP32 S2 make I2C not conflict with Wi Fi? And uh, I have to do some more testing. And I've asked the ESP32 folks, why does this work? Because it's not really clear why it works, but it does work. So, but hopefully that issue is behind us. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Next, I will read the notes from David, and then we will hear from Foamy Guy. Uh, so David writes, more fat and hat on a Pico with Pico to Zero Adapter version 0 0.2 by Red Robotics. It works with the Adafruit BrainCraft hat, but I2S does not work because of non-consecutive pins. 
It works with the Pimeroni rainbow hat, but the touch button doesn't work for an unknown reason. Also tested with the Adafruit Joy bonnet. I squared C not working because of a missing pull up. Uh, the Anavi Play Fat, and the Adafruit Pi Mini TFT 240x240. And there are a couple of Twitter links and a GitHub link there in the notes. And uh, let's see. So we have Foamy Guy up now, and then after that, Hugo. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, last week, I did uh, work on a couple of the libraries that needed a few small changes for the pilot and pre-commit stuff that's been discussed. Um, I did some refactoring in the display text library because uh, we had two different kinds of labels that were both their own classes and that had some code duplication. Um, and so Pilot started flagging that. Um, so I have a PR out there that gets rid of a bunch of the duplication by refactoring it to a base class. Um, I dug into a display a, a little bit to try to gain a better understanding of uh, tile grid and how it works. And I implemented a fix inside of there um, to an, an issue I had found, but I'm not sure if it's really the correct fix. I'm suspicious because uh, it was only an issue on my Pygame display, not uh, in the core on a microcontroller or even like a display on a Pi with a spy display. Uh, but I'm curious to see if that's actually a, a real fix or not that I found. Um, I worked on a PR in uh, Display well, no, it wasn't in the display IO layout, but it was in the bundle repo to add the display IO layout uh, layout library to the bundle. Um, I finished up the display text learn guide. I'll be submitting that for review a little while later today. Uh, I'm going to give it one more once over, and um, I might need to make some tweaks now uh, to talk about the new way that group works. I had some explanation about max size and stuff, which uh, won't necessarily be needed for too much longer. Um, for this week, I will be addressing any of the feedback on the display text refactor uh, and trying to get that merged. Um, I will be reviewing the uh, other, there's a couple other PRs kind of behind it that need um, that refactor in first so that the actions will be happier. Uh, so I'll be going over those once the first one's merged. Um, I would like to figure out how to embed information about the tiles into the tiled map uh, game files so that it can know like which tiles you're allowed to walk on, uh, for instance, maybe some other stuff. And then lastly, I'm going to be looking at the um, the round switch, the uh, the sliding switch that KMatch added uh, to the display layout library. Be testing that out this week. Um, and that's what I got. Thanks. Cool. Well, we will round things out uh, with me reading notes from Hugo. Last week, no forward progress on plans and issues. Uh, the main newer and faster computer died, so all no work work is on the slower and older MacBook. This week, hopefully get to wrapping up progress bar. If possible, the MagTag bitmap issue, uh, specking out and window shopping computers. Are you window shopping Windows computers or Macs? That's what I need to know. All right, sorry about the jokes. Uh, that wraps up Hug Reports, which brings us to the final section in the weeds. Uh, so first on the list is uh, David. Uh, are you ready to go? Um, do you hear me? I do, yes. Take it away. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this weekend um, I figure out that some PR I did long ago was broken because um, new hardware we are using that IS31FL blah, blah, blah library. And then I was a bit uh, annoyed because I guess I've spent a lot of time on that, even if it's very short work to do because um, yeah, it could be done in one hour, but it took me maybe a few attempts. And yeah, so there, 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 were, there, there were incoming PR from all over the place in UK where people try to bring Pimaroni stuff to circuit Python and that library was inflating and inflating. And then finally, uh, Melissa um, yeah, solved everything by putting the peer that bring everything together and solve the issue. But okay, maybe I need to find a way to find all of my peer and see if they need some help to be published uh, or something like that. But they are spread across maybe multiple libraries, so I don't know. 
to search for that in Jitter. Um, so that question, um, I can tell you that when you log into GitHub, um, just on the front page, there's a link that you can click to see oh. all of your open pull requests across all of GitHub, and that is a pretty Everything. useful area. Yeah. yeah. Um, so okay. if you can't find that still, we can kind of walk through it after the meeting while I'm not on mic. Um, but yeah, so definitely yeah, so, but finding I, I all think... of your pull requests can be done. I understand that's not the whole issue you're trying to raise, though. Well, I mean, yeah, the, the issue was mostly that I should have been following that PR and pushing for someone to incorporate that. Um, because if it stayed too long as a PR state, then you get conflict. And yeah, conflict can be solved, but you need a bit of JIT uh, ninja stuff, which is, I've done rebased in the past, but it's a fight every time. Uh, so yeah. Um, and yeah, and the sun, I don't know if someone wants to discuss that, but everything has been solved already. So, uh, so I, our notes and whatever. The only, the only other feedback I would give about get, get being hard is like, just folks should always make sure that the box for allowing maintainers to edit your branch is checked. Um, because I'm totally willing to go in and like rebase for folks if they, if they think that's, uh, if they don't have that experience and don't want to do it. Okay, and the, and the other one is related, um, is, is that Michael Horn, which is having a big, I guess it's big, or what I'm following that since a few years, blog about Raspberry Pi and know the micro bit, uh, wanted to use one of those devices that use that library. And for some reason, he did believe that he needed to create MPI files. And that led him to believe that he needed to install w WSL on his Windows to compile something like the MPI cross. And he made a blog post that explained that horrible story uh, where it seems very complicated to contribute, where, yeah, I've, I almost never do MPI files because that's automatic. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm never going to compile and install that on a Windows machine. But um, And so I was trying to figure out what went wrong. And um, yeah, I mean, if, if he came to the Discord, he would have had instantaneous help. Um, but somehow he worked on his own on a Sunday. And maybe the first experience with doing that kind of work and say, OK, maybe we can learn something from this. Um, and yeah, and you should read the blog post. It's, it's super, I mean, it's not funny. It's like horrible, but, um, and oh, yeah, okay. And, and I mean, they, so you've got a lot of people that are in UK around Pimaroni floating and doing stuff with their hardware, which are no interested by the CP, well, by the Pico and they are kind of attracted by circuit python so we need to catch them mm -hmm. <laughs> um i mean from a marketing or whatever point of view because yeah um that's the right target audience or amplifier that can bring circuit python to a lot more people in that time zone let's say yeah i i agree with you i think I think this happens for a couple of reasons. One is that we were really good at documenting how to build, in quotes, a library using MPY in the readmes of all the libraries. So I think that's one reason people think they have to do it. And then two, I think people coming from Sealand expect you to have to build something. And so it, for anybody who's more experienced, that seems like a natural thing to require. Um, but. I think it's really important that that we should emphasize that no, you don't need MPY files. And in fact, Jerry, I would argue that like you don't need it on an M0. You only need it on an M0 if you can't import it. Um, like yeah, you, which, which often is often is the case on depending on what you're doing. Right. 
Right, but it's not a blanket thing. Like, True. it should be a get to that point where you discover you can't import it and then worry about doing an MPY. Um, and also, just, just you can develop you can on a develop bigger board and then test it. it with MPY on an M0 later. But there are also MPY, the conversion, the, the program to convert is available for download too, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah it, it was. It's a bit hidden. Uh, it's not advertised on circuitpython.org. Um, it was not advertised in that forum discussion on how to compile it yourself. Uh, so, yeah, I found it because I know it exists. Um, but if you don't, yeah. Well, it does seem like, um, you know, there are some workflow things around creating libraries or uh, community libraries or Adafruit libraries that could use better documentation. And I feel like the place that we do that is on the learn system. Um, but of course, as always, you know, to get somebody allocated the time to work on that doesn't always happen right away. But well, it's, it's it's clear. <laughs> hi, hi, Katni. Yes, I was talking hi. about you. Um, <laughs> that it, it's clear that there's probably stuff missing from the learn system, but also I'm not sure whether um, I don't I don't see the name uh, on the screen that uh, Michael you know whether Michael Horn would have seen it on the Learn system or not because you can't always have somebody find the right resource but yeah well no and we provide documentation on the libraries so it's reasonable for an individual to consider that the extent of the documentation um, just you know by looking at it I mean if documentation is provided you know. It, you, you would not by default assume there should be more. Um, so I, I think one th other thing is that we could probably do better with linking um, GitHub and, and learn. Um, I think that's something we kind of want to do um, and we just haven't done it. And um, regarding Pemeroni, um, there were three boards in the last nine days, I think, that were submitted uh, to CircuitPython and circuitpython.org. Um, so that is picking up traction um, potentially slowly, but uh, still they're, they're definitely starting to make their way here. Yeah, uh, those, I mean, like Sandy is not working for Pimaroni anymore. Uh, Michael is not uh, another guy. So it's, yeah, we, we, we have Gadgetoid that did some stuff and um, I've been pushing him a bit to do stuff for their feather board. Um, so it's like, it's individuals. And I've been doing a few boards in the past when trying to use the clue to control my hat and fat. It's because I've got a lot of hat and fat that I don't use anymore because I don't play with Raspberry Pi anymore. Mm -hmm. So I try to use it with your stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think you're doing the right thing. Like, I, I think this is something that we all need to take away from this is like, as as there are more and more people involved, like we all keep our eyes open for people that are using it and have questions about how to use it and can use help w with guidance if they need it uh, about what the, the easiest way to do something is. And well, I think- if make, can you block- Oh, go ahead. If you need a, uh... If you make a new blog post, then people will read the new one, and, and that will help a lot. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by new blog post. Yeah. You yeah. made a long one that make it look complex, and now you can make a short one that oh, yeah. show how easy it is. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's perfectly, I think it's really good to ask these questions to Michael about, like, why did you think you had to do it this way? Like, that's, I, I'm willing to do that. I've opened it. I'll watch this video as well. I'm curious. Um, when I do see things like this on YouTube, I do try to go through the comments and stuff and, and try to clarify. Um, yep. So that's it. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, we've got a second item from Jerry. So if you are ready, you can have the talking stick. <laughs> Thanks. I'll try to make this quick because it looks like Dan's already answered it, but at least if anyone's it, you know, right, curious. So there was a new guide put out this week um, by Brent that uh, nicely describes, you know, how to put an airlift on the Pico, which a lot of people have been interested in doing. And 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 
it works fine. Um, but there was a big emphatic warning statement that you must use V sys pin, not V bus, or you must use the V sys pin to power airlift. And I, I was really puzzled by that because I've been powering mine by the V bus pin. And when I look at and 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 I just wanted to make sure that you know was I confused or was there a mistake or what it what it was. And so as Dan explains, it looks like it's perfectly correct thing to say because the VSYS pin is on the other side of a diode that protects your USB port on your computer or whatever you're powering it from. So that makes a lot of sense, but it does, I think there are some things you have to be careful of, aware of, that when you read the data sheet for the, for the Raspberry, for the Pico, it does say, you know, VSYS has a much broader range of voltages it can run on that are broader than what the airlift could run on. So you could get yourself into some, some problems with that. But at least I think, I think I understand what Dan's saying that in general, if you're just plugging a USB port into V bus, you're better off powering something external extra from Z, V sys rather than V bus, just in case you short something or do something bad when you're wiring it up. If that is, that's what you're saying, Dan. Right. It's, it's just like, don't do this because you might really hurt things. And maybe it should say that. I don't know. I don't know who, who personally wrote the thing, whether what they, what the motivation was. But yeah, I think the guide was by Brent, um, but that's all I know. Yeah, it was. And, 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 you know, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I guess it. Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose you could do something if you yeah, again, if you wired something up wrong, you've got V bus plugged into your right back back feeding. It, it would be a bad thing to do. So. Um, Always good to be safe, but uh, okay. Well, that that clarified it. I just was right, and also if you are powering it from a battery by V bus, and then you plug it in to five volts, then you might blow up the battery. I mean, there are sort of safety issues. There's like damage issues and safety issues. So I think that's why I chose that. All right, and then we have our final in the weeds topic from Katney. Take it away. All right, so in the midst of all of the um, pilot uh, patching and updating, we've run into a number of libraries that do actually have duplicate code and could use a refactor. Um, however, we have one library that uh, pilot failed on the tests directory. And here is the actions run for anybody who's interested. Um, and uh, it raised the question um, because, for example, when we run pilot on examples, we ignore um, missing docs during an invalid name. And I, I guess I don't know the context too well of what we're expecting out of test files in, in the tests directory and libraries and whether or not we should be just running pilot on it as is and expect that it should pass. And so those issues need to be addressed or whether we should be updating it to run with directives um, or what, what the, the thought process is there. And I don't know if anybody has input on that. So I think, go ahead, Jeff. I'll just interject that I also encountered this today on the bitmap font library and in the with tests specifically, with, I, it was either test or tests. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I'm just making sure we're on the same page. Um, and in the PR that I filed incidentally to what I was doing, I went ahead and added like the module level doc strings and then told it to just ignore everything else because, um, you know, it's not code that needs to be read by other people, so the doc strings aren't helpful. And that's the decision I made in the spur of the moment, but it's not necessarily the one we should adopt. Scott, what are your thoughts? I I, I agree that doc strings aren't that important. I think I think the daytime case is actually a particular special case because I think those tests actually originate from C Python. I think that's okay. probably true. Um so I, I think I think generally we could treat tests l the way that we treat examples broadly. Okay. And then for specific cases where there's weird stuff that still is not passing, which I suspect date time will have, 
Yeah. Um, I would just at the top of the file say we're going to disable these checks because we copied this code from C Python okay. and we want it to stay the same. But we should uh, be running. Um, you're you're suggesting that we should be running PyLint against the tests the same way we do examples where it doesn't compare them, so there's no duplicate code check, and um, ignore invalid name and missing doc strings. Yeah, I think starting there is a good a, a good place to start, and then let's. Uh, well, I guess we should probably open an issue to have a, a longer discussion about this. But I think generally, like, I know when I write tests, I have a lot of duplication. That's kind of just the mm -hmm. that's totally fine. Yeah. In, in the case of a of a of a test, but it would be good to like. I wouldn't suggest turning lint off completely because there is a lot of stuff that is like, oh yeah, that that would be good to have consistent. Well, no, that's why I'm I'm saying we can add the tests directory to the um, examples check yep. Yep. in pre-commit yep. so that yep. it just runs it exactly the same way on the test directory. That's I think it might have to be another hook, which is fine, but right. just run it exactly the same way. Yep. Yeah, that sounds like a really good place to start. Okay, and we, I guess we'll file it on CircuitPython then because under and with the library's milestone. Um, yeah, either there or I, I think I cookie cutter is the other place. Oh, I've done yeah, okay, that makes like that. that makes sense. Um, uh, but yeah, the okay. date the date times one's going to be a special case, and you might just have to further disable stuff. Uh, okay, like like for the invalid names of like DT is not a valid name or whatever. Like yes, generally I think that's a good thing to push our tests to not do that. But for in this case for date time where we got it some from somewhere else. Like, let's just leave it. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure if we run it like we run examples, it would include invalid name. Should I ah, make it so it doesn't? I can, no, no, can no. do that because it'll it's be another. Not... I think it's another hook. Like, I it's... think it'll have to be a separate hook anyway. I think mostly the reason that we have invalid name on there is because in examples, a lot of variables are at the top level. Mm -hmm. And uh, PyLint accepts expects those to be like all caps, like correct like globals. Yep, yep. Um, I mean, we could try. It. We could try not doing invalid name on. Okay. On tests, um, but for the daytime ones, we'll have to explicitly. Right. Do it. No, I understand. So yeah, yep. daytime is special. It is. But we're so glad to have it. <laughs> I will. Um... I will probably involve Brent then, uh, as okay. I believe he wrote it, and um, just let him know that the plan is to just basically disable um, individual things as we go, so that okay. it passes because we're, you know, pulling it from somewhere else. Right. Yeah, and, and I think I will... just at the top level it should work. Yep. Agreed. Um, and I will file an issue on Cookie Cutter then, and then um, I will. Uh, I guess I'll talk to to Dylan about getting that added, because um, we'll have to run another patch. I, I or should we just or should we do it individually as we go on libraries that have tests directories? Yeah, I would say like just get it in cookie cutter. So if somebody okay. adds tests later, but I don't think a patch is needed because mo like the vast majority of drivers don't have them. Like, okay. I think you two covered most of them <laughs> between date time and the bitmap, bitmap part loader. Part. Okay. Um, um, easy enough then. I'll 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 just do a do a find yep. on the bundle yep. and um and figure out what has what, and then we'll just apply it to the um to the individual libraries. Perfect. Okay. Um, that was basically my my question. So I'm good. All right, and thanks for getting those action items in the document. Uh, keeps us all honest. Anyway, uh, that brings us to the end of In the Weeds. So coming back out of the weeds, it's time to wrap up the meeting. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for March 8th, 2021. Thanks to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. 
It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held on Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. But a uh, reminder again, the U.S. switches to daylight saving time on March 14. Remember to double check the hour in your local time zone. The new time of the meeting is 2 p.m. in the UTC minus 4 time zone. Um, it is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join 24-7 by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.